Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the final webinar of Applied Social Media Marketing, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University, or CSU. My name is Guy Coward, and I will be your MC. Tonight we've got something a, a little bit different. Uh, we're going to have a, a panel discussion with a lot of the guest lecturers from the short course that we've had so far. Uh, joining you on the panel will be Andrew Mashman, who by now you all know and love after five weeks of the short course. Tim Hill's back from week one, uh, co-founder of social analytics platform Social Status, who took us through uh, some amazing information on how to analyze what we're doing with social media. Beth is the um, Beth Powell is the founder of Digital Marketing Club, uh, coaching and online training business for marketers and non-marketers. Amy Whitfield is a Melbourne-based digital marketer and photographer with clients around Australia and a CSU graduate. And I'll be here just as an MC. Uh, we've also got a little bit of a video from Alicia, which we'll play a bit of and also have more of on the, on the learn.itmasters.edu.au page where you get all your course information and all of the course resources. As usual, get involved in the chat and questions. We ask that you direct questions directly related to what we're talking about tonight to the Q&A section and ask administrative questions via the chat function, questions about resources or, or the exam. Uh, hold all of your exam questions over till the end of tonight though. We're gonna talk to uh, a couple of slides on the exams and we'll, we'll go through all of the relevant information there. I guess we'll just jump right into it though to make sure that we keep it relatively short. Um, welcome Andrew um, and anyone else who wants to have a chat. Hi there Guy, how are you going? Hi everybody who's taken the time out to join us again tonight live. Um, welcome back to week five. Um, it's been a fantastic session or set of sessions I suppose and I suppose it has been because um, working with the people I've been working with Beth and Amy and Alicia and Tim has been sensational for me at a, at a personal level to to get the insights that those guys have been able to bring as well. And then I'm just watching some of the feedback we're seeing on social media and stuff, and it looks like people have really been enjoying the content we stitched together for this this kind of prequel, I suppose, to doing a, a course or something with Charles Sturt University. Tonight, um, I'm got my eyes firmly fixed on my clock so that um, we don't drag things out too much and we have lots of time for our Q&A. So without further ado, we're going to dive into the material that we've got tonight, which is really a just a quick reminder of some of the things we discussed, which then drives us into everybody's top five. And then we'll be able to move into the Q&A panel and Guy will uh, wrap up with a few slides right at the end there. So that's our plan. So this has been a free online course and what it has been is a way for you to have a little quick taste of what a subject at um, CSU and IT Masters would be like. And now you've had a four week essentially session into the subject MGI 533. So it's kind of like you've done, um, you know, you'd be halfway through if this was a real term for a real university. And it goes through quite painlessly. CSU is very much an applied university. So lots of the stuff that you do in the subjects is about applying. So you get to talk about things and do things the way that we've done uh, over the last few weeks or so as well. So as I've mentioned along the way, certainly when I did my own master's, it had a, a major impact on my life, a little bit post the master's actually happening, but it had a big impact on the way you see the world and the way you deal with things. And um, for those who are thinking about it, put it on your bucket list of things to do. And for those who'd like a toe on the water, the grad cert is always a great place to start. And there's lots of different options, even in that small space of subjects. And I'm sure Guy will tell you a bit more about some of those later on. So um, dive into the stuff and here's a little flag quickly for the um, exam. There could be some materials of material on this page, which could appear in the exam. And what it is, it's the objectives we have for a subject, but it's objectives we've tried to deliver with, um, we've tried to deliver with the applied mechanism and as it would appear in a subject and the three things within the subject that we sort of focused on is about analyzing different social platforms and each of you should be really you know confident to be able to do that at the moment um, think about a strategy utilizing a range of platforms to meet you some communication goals and then be able to plan out a strategy and our workbook sheets have led to you being able to do that as well so think about those three points as you move forward also so tonight we're going to wrap the course. We're going to uh, talk a little bit less about social results tonight and have a 
Q and A panel as well. And then, Guy, as we said, we'll talk to you more about the, the exam and the format and how that's going to work at the uh, end of this deck. So let's go through the slides. So first of all, big big thank you to everybody and uh, certainly to uh, IT Masters for helping uh, put this on, facilitating it on and bringing me together with them to make that happen. Thanks to Alicia, Amy, Tim and Beth for getting involved. You know, up to your next guys. Thank you very much for that. And it, I love it because, you know, these are these people who are friends of mine and their colleagues and their professionals in their workplace and they've just dived in, boots and all, up to their necks in, wow, what can we do to make this even better? And certainly we've seen that with everyone. And then I want to thank all of you guys who have been busily out there posting and doing and getting involved and asking questions and um uh, flooding my notifications on Twitter with uh, all the different things that are so worthy of talking about. Helene, uh, who can I sit there? Vincent, you've been a massive tweeter. Thank you very much. Christine, also very powerful. Sally, Roseanne's been very busy the last few days, and Laura, and um, one of my favourites, Purple Pyjamas. So everybody's got stuff going on. Everybody's doing things, and I hope everybody's really benefited from the material we've been able to put together for this course. And for, for me, that's a win in its own right if, if every person gets one, things, one thing out of the course that they can take forward to improve their, their lot in life, improve their business life, improve the lives of uh, people around them, whether they're working for a commercial organisation or a not-for-profit. So here we go, and I'm going to be... Um, just reminding you about why social is such a big thing. Uh, we've, we've talked about this right from week one, that social is growing massively. It's one part of kind of digital communication that is just outstripping the others. And the stat down there that 87% of Australians own smartphones, really, really important. It says that a lot of the 25 million people who call Australia home can be reached via a smart device. Mobile traffic up 11% and all other types of uh, internet-based traffic and digital traffic is in decline. So to your desktop PC, to your notebook, to your tablet device, to your games platform, that's all in decline in Australia. So mobile is massive for social. So putting those two things together, there's it, it's, it's a statement saying that if you're a business and you want to communicate to people, you've both got to be on mobile and you've got to be on social as well. From the business perspective, there's reasons why business also cannot afford not to be thinking about social media particularly because, um, you know, we've seen what's happened with mainstream media. We're seeing what's happening with Fairfax and Channel 9 unfolding as we speak, you know, combining newsrooms, this and that. Uh, Channel 9 is a very ratings-driven organisation. Fairfax probably wasn't such a ratings-driven organisation. Uh, people are going to be looking for new ways to get information about all sorts of things from from products they want to buy but also points of view about who to give to who to support a range of things and social media is the the hands up champion in potentially making that happen so that's massive for me uh, the second one there is never before has there been ways for organizations to learn so much about customers than through the use of social media you actually get to read the scripts watch the videos that your customers have posted and written as we watching on the, the chat part of the Zoom session right at the moment, and you get to understand them better than you've ever been able to do before. And certainly for small businesses, they've been able to get information now that, um, you know, would have been massive research programs for very big organisations and financially out of reach for organisations. So bring on social for that reason for me, for sure. Uh, we have worked through a deck and we supplied this in week one. I believe it's up on the resources still. And... Um, it's just a, how would I, you know, think about which social media tools to use? Well, you need to go down this list and answer the questions. This one was done for last week about Facebook. There's a range of things there. If you struggle in any way to answer any of the questions that are there, then you have to rethink about, is this going to work for me and my target audience? So use these. Uh, there's a million social media tools out there. So there's a million uh, versions of this sheet that can be done up and it, but it has to work for your organisation, which is the, the most important about that, and that's going to come in, in my top five. This grid here, uh, Alicia showed us a slightly different one. Other people have used different versions of this as well. And um, the it's just a very simple grid aimed at being able to communicate to other stakeholders in your business about the things that you're going to do within your digital marketing plan particularly, but within your social me media campaigns as it would be as well. So things like objective for a tool, who's the target market to that tool, when are we going to do that, 
who's responsible for it, what are the details of making it work and interacting with it, and where's the progress. So there's a lots of lots of versions of this kind of sheet out there, but get one, use one, build one for your organisation, and use it as a kind of body of knowledge that oh yeah we did this before, let's let's tweak that for our next session, and use it to communicate to the people that you need buying from in your organisation to make social media work and to to make sure management buys in for it as well. Um, so my first five top, top tips, and I was just looking at the photo I chose for that today. Um, I'm, I feel a little bit like the Stig, I think. I'd rather wear my helmet a lot more often than I do. You, you've seen my, um, my head in some of the videos that I've been producing. It's a bit harder to hide in that, and I did think this afternoon maybe I should wear a helmet in those as well. But uh, motorcycling is one of the things I like to do, and uh, if I had choice, I'd be out doing more of it. And if I was fitter, I'd do more of it as well. But tonight, that's the image you get of me. Uh, so my top five tips for social media for your brand is, number one, know who your target market is. This is just so, so critical. It's a, it's a 101 marketing issue. But it's kind of a realization that people don't quite have. They go, oh, yeah, we're going after customers. Yeah, anyone, any customer will be be excellent. You know, who's the customer? Let's just, just go, go get some customers. But really, you can broadcast like that and be mainly unsuccessful or you can narrow cast because you have this beautiful insight and knowledge about who your target market is and you can go after them directly speak the language of them send them send them the photos be they cute dogs or whatever else that you want to send them um, know what time of day they're online or offline know about how they travel to work know what frustrates them know what their pain points are know how you can be seen as a solution to that and businesses that are big and brands that are big are able to know that better than ever before so it's a it's a it's a moving feast so you need to have good strong target market information to be successful in this space the second one is to know what your organization expects from being in in this case social media or being in any product or service you might offer i do like simon sinek's why concept so what the, why are we here what's going on why are we doing this we're here because we want to save lives change minds get voted in, sell products, uh, change the world through, you know, um, uh, bionic ears and, and hearing transplants and things like that, whatever the things might be, make sure you know what that's about and then, you know, let that go out to your customers and let them be engaged in the story that you're engaged in. Then you have this kind of synergy between what the business wants and what the target market wants and then you start really hitting your straps in terms of how to be successful in the marketplace and social media is no different there. If you communicate about stuff that is not really true to your organization's you know, being or why, then you're going to find people will unfriend you, dislike you, not like you, not share your content, etc. If you're true to your cause and you know who your target market is, who's interested in that cause, it's going to go gang gangbusters for you. So think about that. Cannot do enough work in both of those two areas as well. My third one is choose tools that will work for you. And there's probably two sides to this. One is that we can use them to reach our target market. So that's a number one thing. Second part of that though is that we can manage it within our business. And, you know, there's, there's lots of organizations out there. They've got a number of tools on the boil and they're doing none of them very well at all. So you're better off to, as which is my fourth point, start small and then grow grow out so start with one social media tool start working with your target audience or the stakeholders or the people you want to influence but be consistent about it be um smart and other guys are going to talk about different aspects of this tonight as well but be you know flow and plan and and make it work for you rather than being really spasmodic and fragmented and disorganized because that just looks exactly those sort of things and people are looking for someone to trust so you need consistency to make that happen the fifth and final one for me is uh, be responsive and that means social media is a 24-7 two-way conversation it's not oh we're just going to put some stuff out there and see what happens it's about responding to your people that have liked or shared or noted or asked questions being as as proactive as that as you can and having a kind of policy and an idea about how to manage it when it gets a bit awkward or when it gets a bit toey and how to move those conversations offline but still still solve the problem and still grow trust in your brain to make those happen so that's my top five um things you can ponder there for a while i'm sure and um plenty plenty more to talk about as we go through so i'm going to pass it over to Tim now and I think Guy you'll you'll unleash Tim will you and um, we'll hear what Tim's got to say about his top five yeah, I've, I've been unleashed <laughs> thanks thanks very much Andrew um, 
I guess uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to also thank um, yourself, Guy, and everyone at IT Masters. This has been great. Um, I think this is like what a fantastic, um, you know, five weeks to uh, provide everyone with a bit of a, a, a teaser or a taste of um, social media um, at CSU. So I'm very, very happy to be involved. I thought tonight I'd like to share um, my five tips for extending reach and engagement for social marketers. So uh, what we did uh, this week was we had actually had a look across um, a lot of the accounts uh, that have been um, added throughout social status. So that's actually 40,000 plus. So that's, that's pretty much, um, yeah, in the last few years. And we wanted to understand what is it, what is it about content uh, that performs well from a reach and an engagement standpoint. And this first point, about um, utilizing rich media, I guess is, I, I would say probably the most important. So um, by rich media, we're really just talking about video here or at the very least creating movement in the newsfeed. So whether that's on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn, if you can create movement, um, whether that be through video or even like animated GIFs or um, you know other formats like, like live, or 360, uh, your content is likely to be a bit more disruptive. Um, that is a, a, a fairly general statement, but it is a trend that has been on certainly throughout the year and you know doesn't seem to be dying down. So um, yeah, generate as much as possible within all of the content that you're creating um, video. I think that's, that's just a, a great way to increase reach and engagement. That's my, my second point is kind of related to video as well. Um, and it, that is to, to try to capture attention in the first five seconds. So a big question when uh, people or marketers think about creating video is, well, how long should the video be? Like, should we make a two minute video or a five minute video? And I would always bring this back to, um, it's, it's probably less important about the length of the video. It's more important, um, I would say, the first five seconds, like can you actually capture someone's attention? If your video kind of fades in and there's a title screen and, and, and an establishing shot, like that's in, in most cases on social, that's you, 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 you may be in territory where you lose people. So I think, um, you know, focus on those first few seconds. Um, generally a human talking to camera is a really good, good way to do that. And um, try to capture that attention because if you do, can do that, then it doesn't really matter too much as to as to how long that video is. Um, what we're seeing with with mobile now is people are watching much longer on mobile devices than than they were, say, a year or or eighteen months ago. So I think, um, yeah, don't be too concerned with video length. The third point is actually again kind of related to video, and that's the stories format. So this is uh, a bit specific to Instagram and Facebook. Uh, but you know, YouTube's just rolled out stories and, um, I think we're going to see much more of this format now. Um, who knows, maybe we're going to see even see stories on LinkedIn one day, but these are the, the 24 hour, um, you know, bite sized pieces of content that are portrait or, or vertical by, um, by their definition. So I think, um, you know, we've been really used to creating, uh, content in the news feed and generally in a landscape format for video. So that's with the phone, phone tilted to its side. And as uh, content creators, I guess we've been creating landscape video since, since the dawn of cinema. Um, and suddenly here we now find ourselves in this reality where we've got portrait video, which is, you know, really, you know, stories has only been around as a format for the last two, two or two and a half years. So uh, this, I think, you know, it's fair to say is, is a real, real big shift in uh, users' behavior. Now they're spending as much time in, in stories as they are in the news feed or the kind of vertically scrolling feed. So really think about what you can do in this um, very video kind of centric portrait or vertical format. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's uh, probably no surprise to see that, yeah, these, these, First three points are all about video. Um, the next two, so point number four, report on key performance stats monthly. I think that's a really good way to just communicate performance to your clients, to your boss, to your stakeholders. Um, 
I think if you can find uh, a way to to make that part of the agenda, at least every month, you know, how are we going on social um, and how is it kind of delivering value back to the business? I think that's, that's um, you're in a good place then to, you know, prove ROI and, and kind of, you know, invest more in, in it as channel. And finally, ABT, always be testing. And I think uh, a, a common approach I always talk about is um, uh, one of perpetual beta. Like you're, you're never kind of finished, you're never done learning on social. It's such a um, dynamic channel um, and one that, um, especially from an ads perspective, changes almost kind of, you know, weekly. So always have that mindset of testing. So if I think that this can settle any argument in an organization. Should we post photo A or photo B or do this post or that post? Like do them both, like run a test. Let's see how it goes. So I think, um, yeah, always have that methodology when you're, when you're approaching social. And finally, um, yeah, that, that link there, itmasters.socialstatus.io slash sign up will get you a uh, five-week trial to social status if you haven't yet already uh, done that and will be a bit longer than the uh, four-week, oh, sorry, the 14-day the trial. So with that, um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Amy. Thanks so much, Tim. Amy, unleashed. <laughs> I'm in. Hi everyone. Thanks again for having me and it's awesome to be back. It's been such a, such a great um, time just to interact with everybody and to hear all of these different perspectives from these amazing marketers. So thanks again, Andrew and everyone for having me on. Um, so my top five content tips. Um, this is a bit of a recap of what we spoke about in week two, but um, here we go. So you can make great content with what you already have. So a lot of us have iPhones and my top tip would be to clean your lens. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's on your shirt. I know I'm going to get some feedback from that being scratched the lens, but I don't mind as long as it's not foggy and blurry, um, clean it straight up. And there's also the hidden talent within teams. You know, there might be something happening that needs to be captured on the spot and knowing who's good within your team and identifying that talent could be um, an interesting thing. You never know who can take a nice photo. Um, there's also plenty of free tools and paid tools for editing and publishing that we have at our disposal. So whether it's Visco, Lightroom and Schedulegram like I like or whether it's other, other programs that are your favourites. Um, there's plenty of tools that we have at our disposal to create content with what we've already got. My second tip would be to personify your brand. So this is something I think about a lot. As soon as I approach a, um, a new brand that I'm photographing for, um, I try and think of them as, as a person, like how do they see, how do they, what are their interests? Um, how should they come across? What is their vibe? What are their nuances, their favorite things? And you learn when you're creating on behalf of a brand, um, all of those little nuances and habits, their favorite words, their, what type of style of language they use and different interests, the things that they like to talk about that might not just be what the business objectives are. It's all of that supporting, interesting, identity building stuff that you can do around your brand as if your brand was a person. And it also makes it really easy when um, you've got a few people who are contributing to the content. Um, if everyone knows who that person is, the language and the way you communicate can be a lot clearer and a lot more consistent. My third um, point is to align your content themes with your business objectives. So in um, content strategies that I develop with my clients, we always think about what are your main messages to get across. So if it's, I use this example um, as, as a cafe, you might have the, the best interior that's award winning. So you want that to be a content theme that comes through all of the time with all of your communications. You also want to have your coffee come through or your signature dishes and maybe your staff as well. So there could be these themes that are consistent that run through all of your messaging all the time and they should align with what your business objectives are. Um, and number four, be consistent with your style. So this, this um, works with the personification of your brand. If you know exactly what that voice is, 
um, but also what your visual rules are. So what are your visual guidelines? What are the filters you always use? Be consistent. You want people to land on your Instagram page or anywhere on your social media and to instantly recognize your brand personality through visuals and your tone of voice. You want people to, um, yeah, just know you and come to expect the different styles and be consistent. It, it builds trust and trust is where we convert. And number five is be local. So I would say tune into and find those hashtags um, that are really local, hyper-local and get involved in some conversations. So assume that brand identity that you have like, and get involved with the community, be local. Um, I would also say, I'd like to say, shop local this Christmas. Small businesses appreciate it. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to say, don't use stock images. Create, um, yeah, use a photographer if you need to or create content yourself. And that really speaks true to your brand. So you can be, stand out and be individual online. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So would uh, next next slide be Beth's entry? I think we're going to just talk through Alicia's slides uh, first. Okay, beauty. no worries. Right. Thanks for that, Amy. Such a uh, lots of great points there as well to make that happen. And uh, the persona thing is massive again for understanding who you are and the why, and then the organisational objectives. Thanks for reinforcing that one as well. Now, Alicia was unable to be with us tonight. She's a very busy working woman. She has. Um, family and she's she's looking after a mum tonight I believe so that's great I can see she's very very busy on Twitter though so she's she's just, and actually when you watch this video I'll tell you about we know she's a very good multitasker so Alicia's given us five tips which I'm going to fly through for you but on the screen now you can see a YouTube link she's cut together a short video about 70 minutes worth about a day in the life of a social media marketer and um, that's well worth a watch. And I'm just going to show you the last portion of that as we get to the end of her top tips. So let's just fly into those. So first one, number one for Alicia is ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? And this is massive. You know, this is why are we here doing this and, and what's going on? And Alicia's working with Lowe's at the moment on the digital transformation of that business. And they've obviously invited her into that business because they can see, and as we've seen with Roger David and and a number of other retailers all around the Myers and David Jones struggling bricks and mortar retail is in a really difficult place. So they're trying to achieve something new. They're trying to talk to new audiences. They're trying to be cooler than they used to be. Maybe they're trying to be more applicable in a range of people's lives. They're trying to talk to mums of kids buying school uniforms. And so understand what you are trying to achieve with your particular startup brand product service so that you know how to move forward on that one. Oh, let me click on the page there again. There you go. Tip number two is be committed and be consistent. Um, yeah, can't just make that few posts and make it happen. So think about everything. Alicia runs a plan at least two weeks in advance of social media style posts, but they're also able to spontaneously jump on trending hashtags and those kind of things. And then be consistent. If you've got a cheeky brand, which Lowe's is in the kind of places we've seen them communicating during this course, then keep that cheekiness going and make that work for you. Don't be cheeky one day, conservative the next day, a bit blue the day after, and then a bit feminist the day after that. Get a plan about what you'll do. And again, this comes back to your brand persona and how you're going to make that work as well, but be committed and be consistent. Tip number three from Alicia is understand the purpose of social media platforms. And we saw that uh, Android note in Alicia's presentation last week, and she's redone it again for you around the, the CSU use of a different uh, number of different social media tools. But different tools will do different things for, for people. And, and Pinterest, for example, is you know heavily visual. It's uh, got a strong female audience as well. Then we've got Twitter, lots of different groups use that for political purposes, for interest groups and those kind of things. They're very different tools and you need to work out which ones you're going to use for which parts of your brand or business communications and which ones are relevant or which ones are, you know, we don't even want to touch. And I have to say, you don't want to get involved in a social media channel only to have to pull out or to have people finding your account with no posts for three years on it. That's 
you know, that limits trust in your brand again and erodes the sort of value of what could have been achieved in that space. And then maybe you've got to make a comeback later, which is maybe even harder than a good planned entry and a consistent flow through what's going on. Tip number four from Alicia, hashtags and video. She believes that these are the hot two topical things by, by putting or leveraging other people's cool hashtags uh, together with fun content, as Tim was just talking about, getting that first five seconds working, get people hooked, I suppose you would say, into, oh, wow, that's interesting. Wow, that's something I wanted to know about. Wow, I'm going to share that with my friends. And hashtags are kind of a way of curating chunks of information together. And if you do the searches within any of the social media tools or within Google now around mad marketing, I get digital or IT masters, you'll see that we've been able to generate a heap of content under those hashtags, which didn't exist five weeks ago. So um, that's the power of the hashtag that's in Google. But if you're, if you're focused on a particular platform like Facebook or um, Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn as it might be, uh, hashtags allow you to do more even more powerful things than you could do with a, a single account to make things happen tip number five from Alicia is b2b social media and this was brought up as a question about you know can b2b's use social media much in about week three so we've, we've tried to bring a bit more information this way and Alicia's come up with a list of cool ways that businesses can use social media to communicate to other businesses which are are using social media to communicate maybe to their customers or to other business business to business customers as well so lots of things you can do there that um, you know we talked about Twitter, being able to discover something new and interesting. So a business will have new and interesting products and services, new ranges. They want to relaunch butter as it might be. There's ways to build that into the social media tool and to grow it and to engage people with that. And that's what this course has been largely about. So no holds there for business to business marketers as well as business to consumer marketers. And that is Alicia's last slide. So I'm just going to duck out to... Um, the internet here and show you a piece of video and we'll just play that one. This is um, Alicia's wrap up for you guys, which she's on a video. This link is to the video that you can see online tonight after the session. And uh, it'll always be there about a day in the life of um, a social media marketer and her top five tips. Let me just hit play on that. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, a day with me uh, and I've provided some, at the very least, interesting um, ideas of how to approach social media from a B2B and B2C perspective. This is Tim. He deserves some attention now. So, uh, sorry, sorry, Andrew, I think it's at the end of the video. Do you want to jump to the start? Was, it that, was that what you wanted to show? Now, I was just going to play the last bit. Right? Okay. Techniques. I'm sure the other guest speakers will provide you with many, many ideas and tools, as will Andrew. And I'd like to say thank you, and I'll see you again. There you go, guys. That was just Alicia's sign-off for you, and that video is available to watch in, in total on... Um on YouTube for you based on that link on that first slide of hers as well. So let me just go back to that slide. So Sorry for interrupting that. Sorry, no worries, Guy. That was good. Um, I think actually Alicia might have put that together just to chuck the dog in there because we, we know that dogs have been getting lots of likes in this uh, process. So I think she's just done a, a tactic there to up her um, uh, engagement with uh, the social media channels that she's working on. So, hey, Beth, Beth's there as well. And she's done an awesome job reaching out to people in the chat room particularly. I've also seen her on a bit of Twitter tonight as well. So we might hand to you, Beth, and tell us about your top five for Facebook. Thanks, Andrew. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here again tonight. I've enjoyed this. I haven't, I haven't participated in something like this before, quite as big as this, I must say. And uh, I've got to say, I just think the uh, administration of it's just been fantastic. You know, the way that you guys manage the platform and the chat, switching between them all. So um, thank you. It's been a great experience for me, and I've really enjoyed, you know, looking at people's feedback and questions and everything in the chat. It's so so friendly and good to see everybody answering each other's questions and whatnot. So my top tips for Facebook. So uh, I've been talking about this a lot lately, um, about how 
um, I hear from businesses too much that what they're focused on with social media marketing is leads. And, you know, I hear oh, Facebook, you know, Facebook marketing doesn't work and, you know, comments like that. And the reason why people don't, people say that is they expect it to be like Google search and it's not like Google search. So when, when people are just browsing and cruising in Facebook and Instagram, you'd have to say they've got a low purchase intent. And so we need to understand that. And so not have the expectation that people are just going to fill in a lead form straight away when they see your ad. So that's something to keep in mind. And for, you know, for, for the marketers amongst you, it's really, um, an education process or, you know, setting expectations within the business about the role that Facebook plays. So as I've said, the role it plays is part of the reach, act, convert and engage process. And we follow the process, but it's not only in Facebook and Instagram that we follow that process. So, you know, when we're in the convert stage or we're going to add some, you know, Google search ads or, or a more, um, you know, conversion uh, channel around that, um, our goal is firstly to focus on no like trust. So quite a few of the, um, of the panellists have, have talked in a similar way to this. You know, I call it no like trust. This is what we're trying to do. So whether you're, um, you know, a car dealership, I work with lots of car dealerships, what we're on about there is no like trust. If you're a real estate agent, you know like trust. If you're a B2B software provider, for example, then what you what you're trying to do with your Facebook um, and Instagram marketing is to develop um, a rapport and a trust with people so that you become the preferred supplier. Um, and I think that that's really a good point that we're we're trying to when somebody comes to the point where they're going to make a decision about purchase or a conversion decision, it's a no-brainer about where they go, right? Because you've done the no like trust work in your social media marketing. So. That's really, I've just covered in a little speech, points one, two, and three. My fourth point is about the Facebook pixel, which I talked about quite a bit in week uh, three. So uh, your task is to get the Facebook pixel on your website. And what, just a recap here, the Facebook pixel is a piece of code that you create with an ad account, or you can create it within Facebook Business Manager. And you put that code on every single page of your website and then you optimize specific pages with some extra code so that you trigger and track events that people take and events is uh, a Facebook word for desired behaviors you know so you want somebody to download that brochure you want somebody to watch that video you want somebody to submit that form all of those things are events so you customize that pixel so that you're tracking events and then you know you're able to um, allow you know Facebook as a really smart marketing platform to do its work for you so you can then optimize your ads for conversions because you've identified to Facebook what a conversion is and it can go about finding the right people for your for your advertising for you know the particular goals you've got whether that's you know traffic or reach or engagement and so on brings me to my final point um, which uh, in week three, I took you through uh, how to create an ad in Ads Manager. So there was a quick video there. You might want to recap it. Um, but, uh, you know, basically my advice is to get busy with Ads Manager and you can't break it. So if you're inexperienced with it, then just go into Ads Manager and play around. And, and then with a small budget, if you haven't done advertising before, then test traffic, video views, engagement. Uh, engagement is usually around event ads and post engagement and your messenger objectives and combine those objectives with interests and behaviours audiences. So an interest and behaviours audience is where you choose, uh, uh, you know, a demographic, so location, gender, age group and so on with interests that somebody has or the behaviours that they've recently undertaken, such as, you know, purchased um, landlord insurance or something like that, in order to identify an audience that you think is going to fit with the target audience that you've already identified through your customer persona work and so on that Andrew's been talking about. And then the second audience to focus on is retargeting audiences. And the reason why we do that is 
you know, if I'm wondering, if I want to buy one of those trail bikes that Andrew's got and I've got no idea who sells them in my area, I'll start searching online and I'll visit some websites. And I'm just curious at that stage, right? I'm just trying to think about, you know, where would I find one of those road bikes like Andrew's got, no, trail bikes like Andrew's got. And um, uh, what it what retargeting does is it enables a business to start a conversation with that person. So, you know, we, we, we don't want to think about retargeting advertising as negative. It's actually really positive. So somebody's curious looking around. So as a business, start that conversation. And that's what retargeting does for you. So two things, interest and behaviors at the top of the funnel and then retargeting audiences to start that conversation with people who are actively looking. Um, so that's my five tips. Uh, back to you, Guy, I think. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All righty. What's next, Andrew? Excellent, Beth. Thank you very much for that. I'll click back on my screen there. Um, yeah, what's next, Guy? I think this is oh. your slide, mate. I'm going <laughs> to talk you through this. Rightio. Uh, this is a slide that was put in a little late. You can see there I am at Wagga Beach. Uh, as those watching the chat would know, a bunch of us are at the... Wagga graduations uh, with CSU folk. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the top five reasons to have a Nokia uh, 3310. And these are uh, five points that Andrew has, I guess, uh, deduced <laughs> uh, just from uh, what he knows about me and what he knows about the Nokia 330. Uh, yep, fair enough. Point one, formerly the number one mobile brand. Uh, a lot of brand loyalty there. Um, whenever I go for a smartphone or from a smartphone to a dumb phone, um, and it hasn't been a Nokia in the past. I haven't known how to use it and it gets really frustrating and end up just buying a crappy Nokia anyway. So I should probably have just done it in the first place and now I just do. Uh, snake isn't actually really a consideration, but instead of snake, we'll say uh, a complete lack of self-control. Um, smartphone has access to the internet. Internet has access to cat gifts and Facebook and, and all the things we've been talking about here, really, and news websites, and I hate to say it, sports websites, uh, and I just don't get anything done. So uh, it's like going to the shops and not buying the packet of biscuits. Uh, you can't have them at home if you don't buy them. So uh, that's point two. Long battery life can confirm. Uh, I have been in Wagga for three days. I'm sure Angie, who has been using his smartphone, has had to charge his phone at least twice a day. I didn't even bring my charger and I'm going strong still. Uh, low risk of theft? I don't know. I don't, you can probably hear Angie chuckling away in the background. Um, so low risk of theft, I'm not sure about that. It's a pretty beautiful phone. Everyone I see says, oh, I really want one. It's really pretty because it's that lovely blue color as you can see. Um, by the way, that's that is the Murrumbidgee River uh, in Wagga. People come for the university but stay for the river. Um, it's a beautiful beach. They dumped some sand there and it's, um, it's quite a lovely time. Quite a strong current, so um, not for those who aren't confident in the water. Um, but people, I reckon, would definitely steal this phone because it's wonderful and because these five points are watertight. Uh, especially point five, can't be expected to do social media for your boss. Thank goodness. Um, thank goodness to Claire and Angie and MJ at IT Masters who have been doing so much of the, of the work for this one, as well as Sophie in, in week one. Uh, yeah, I couldn't do it if I tried. I would have no interest if I could. Um, so thank you so much. No worries, Guy. Thank you for getting involved with that, mate. And thanks for being a great host over the session. It actually, um, the last time we did one of these, we didn't have a host like yourself uh, at all. So I think it brings a lot of value and definitely makes the sessions more fluid and uh, smoother. So. I'm stoked on that. And I think all the people who are attending have been involved in that as well. And the fact that on this course, that one of the people who's outside of the 87% of Australians who do have smartphones is involved in it is fantastic. I'm really loved about that. So excellent, mate. Thank you very much for that. Now I'm going to leave it to you to talk about the top five tips for our exam or quiz. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. Well, I'll look at these. Um, yeah. Well, think, Think about the applied social to frame your answers, yes. Um, all of the questions will be from the content, from the webinars and from the links uh, and, and resources on the learn.itmasters.edu.au page. Um, all the questions are multiple choice um, and they're drawn um, and you can 
basically have a look at all of the questions at once. You've got one hour to do it once you start the exam. Uh, and make sure that you uh, set yourself up properly. You know, um, there's a timer that starts once you start and that won't stop even if your computer dies, if your internet connection dies. Um, if you get really caught short, you can get in touch with us and we'll be able to set you up with a reset. But um, yeah, it's a, if a lot of people are doing it, it becomes quite onerous. Uh, before you can sit the exam, you'll need to complete all of the module quizzes, which is sort of the, the tool that we use just to cement, you know, uh, some key takeaways from each module. Um, you need to pass each of those. Those quizzes don't are not account are taken into account when we come up with your course mark, but they are a, a participation hurdle um, in order to get to the exam. Your course mark is made up of the marks that you get from the exam, and for those of you that are doing a course live, um, from points for forum partis points for forum participation. For those of you that have been, you know, engaging with the forums, um, it's, it's just an incentive to make sure that people are, uh, are really um, chatting with each other and sort of augmenting the understanding that they're gaining from the webinars and sort of um, fleshing things out. Uh, uh, at the end of the exam, um, well, after, after a, a while, we'll, we'll close down the forums and you won't be eligible for points for forum participation. Uh, and then once that happens, we'll also release the course certificates. Um, they'll be able to be downloaded from the same page just underneath the exam. You'll be able to access it. Um, and for all of the exam like deadlines and, and, and um, uh, I guess key dates, um, we'll send an email out to everyone, let you know that, all right, we're going to shut down the forums um, or right, we're going to um, release the certificates. You can access them now. Um, so that's most of the exam questions. The, the quizzes, I'll, I'll, I assume there'll be a few questions in the Q&A, so I'll just have a quick look at that now. Uh, no, great, it's all about good course content related stuff, so that's nice. Um, so uh, the only other thing really um, is after you've done the quiz and after you've got the certificate, once you've finished with the course, um, all of the materials will be available to you in perpetuity. Um, but once you have completed the course, we'd really appreciate if you took a couple extra minutes to complete a course satisfaction survey, which we'll unlock after tonight, um, which is found at the bottom of the course page underneath the assessment information. The quiz just contains a, a few questions related to the short course and should only take a couple minutes. Um, um, but if you want to spend a little bit more time, you know, giving us some richer data, like telling us what you actually think as well as just giving number ratings, that'd be really handy because it, um, because uh, your anonymous answers will be as the Nokia goes off. Um, <laughs> a less, uh, it's, it's not a, it's a, not a silent phone. Um, your anonymous answers will be reviewed as part of an improvement strategy and your feedback is therefore really valuable and helps us make future courses better. Um, so I'm sure um, there's plenty of information on the, on the learn.itmasters.edu.au course page. Um, so if you do get stuck, you can read through that and then you can always get in touch if you, if you want, but the exam is available in perpetuity. So it looks like it's time for a, a panel discussion. Um, we've got a bunch of great questions and I was thinking we just, um, only those that have something to say at the time would, would unmute, but I reckon we'll just let everyone have at it. Um, I'll unmute everyone and maybe throw a few prompts to people. Um, and I guess we'll start with one that I saw in chat earlier. Um, I'll try and find it because, of course, now there's a lot more chat. But let's find it. Yes, it was from Benjamin. And he was saying, fantastic. Thanks very much, Amy. He was talking about your uh, presentation. And he's keen for a, a comment in the panel discussion about um, whether a business can talk to two or three different client personas um, without having multiple brands. So like no doubt Lowe's would also hope that people that aren't cheeky or don't enjoy that cheeky uh, persona would also shop there. Is it, is it difficult with social media um, without creating extra brands? And anyone can jump in, but we'll start with Amy perhaps. 
Hey, um, thanks for the question, Benjamin. I would say that um, you should definitely be yourself as a brand. Don't try and force different um, voices to different audiences. Just stay true to that brand voice and people will respect you for that. If your um, audience spans across different genres and like different demographics and has different interests, just stay true to yourself. And if you want to target people specifically with different messages, you can narrow that down through your advertising. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I would say the same thing. So, for example, with car dealerships, um, car dealerships need to show personality, right, because otherwise, uh, well, they can kind of look the same. And uh, so we bring dogs in and, you know, dogs are tremendous in car dealerships and immediately lend personality to it. And it doesn't mean then that we're only targeting one demographic or one kind of person. We're kind of showing a personality of um, of that particular business to all demographics and it, and it belongs in the community. So, for example, if the car dealership is in Wagga Wagga, where, where Guy is tonight, then we're going to do, we're going to feature images that are in the local area. We're going to have um, the, the products are going to be pictured in, um, you know, ideally where someone can identify that as a local area picture. Um, you know, if there's a dealership dog, all the better, we'll whack them in the back of the Hilux, you know, and take the image out. And people doing the things that they would normally do, taking photographs of people doing the, the kinds of things that they would normally do in the area. And so that way you kind of, you, you do two things. You localise it, because I saw there was a question about how do you do local. So we localise it, plus we give the business personality that is not tied to demographics. Alrighty. Anyone else want to have a crack? Or perhaps we'll go to another question. Uh, a lot of exam questions, just to let you know, it will be available in perpetuity. The only reason we suggest that you do it soon is so that you get points for forum participation and also make sure you actually do it. We often find that um, having a setting a deadline actually helps people to, to achieve things. Uh, okay, uh, about shopping local. Um, David's asking, um, he just created a separate Twitter account for Indonesian audience. Um, so should each, uh, I guess, area of interest be something that people should be focusing on local matters? Um, or is there sort of, I guess, things that can be, can translate across local areas or across geogra geographical areas? I can have a, a crack at this one if you like, Guy. Sure. Um, but just because the first part of that question, was that about creating a separate account? for a particular area? Or, or just if, if people are launching things in different areas, different geographical areas, should they be, I guess, engaging local in, in all of those different areas? Yeah, I think being local as possible is, is really the most powerful thing. Uh, people, you run the risk when you go at a more generic, even national, certainly global scale, that people think, oh, that's not quite for me. That's not we the way we do things around here, i.e. the Hilux with the dog in the back in Wagga. But there will be bits and pieces of, of your branding, the, the, the text you can use, um, which you can then top and tail with some local graphics maybe or some local hashtags possibly as well to get that kind of local ownership as you, as Beth also mentioned, so you can convert that sale and people feel like, oh, yeah, this is, this is for us. It's not for everybody. It's for us. And I guess that's one of the downsides to using hashtags, which are trending on a global scale, is there's a heap of stuff like Black Friday, for example, which is, you know, it's definitely Black Friday is less relevant in Australia than it is if you're in the US for that matter. So you need to walk a fine line between getting as much local as you can and you can actually reach out to get because you're probably Sydney based and you're trying to communicate into Western Queensland, for example, then you need to sort of work that fine line between those two things to make that come together in a way that people adopt because they think it's part of their community and it's full of good ideas from maybe outside of their community as well. So global products or um, better value or whatever those things might be to, to make that work. Beauty, thank you. I've uh, got a great question from Dodzy. Uh, what, and maybe we'll start with Tim for an answer for this one. Um, what happens when we reach peak social media? Uh, what comes next? As wow. advocate, as, yeah, that, it's, a, it's a big question. That's um, a great question. He goes on saying, like, as you know, like as ad blockers become even more popular, um, 
He wonders whether it'll wither on the vine once everyone tires of it and blocks anything other than essential information. Well, um, what's next? Gosh, that's a, that's a great one. I think, you know, if you look at um, that moment in time where um, social and digital ad spend overtook TV, that was that happened three years ago. And um, Colour TV was launched uh, 50 years before that. So if you look at kind of media revolutions, um, it's fair to say that we've got social now for the next 47 years. Um, that's, that's quite, uh, it, that may sound a bit like an absurd thing to say, but I think we are very much in the infancy that like it may feel like we've lived with social for a long time, but, um, like, I think, I think it's, it's kind of here to stay. I think it, it just kind of comes down to, um, uh, the fragmentation question more like we're, we're seeing new, uh, social channels and, and, and apps pop up all the time. So I think for marketers and advertisers, it's just our, our jobs will just become more, more difficult because we'll have to, um, I think, you know, s- tell our message and, and um, communicate using more and more, increasingly more and more channels to reach more kind of disparate groups of people. Um, yeah, so I don't, don't know whether that completely answers it, but um, yeah, I think I've if got anything, a few thoughts. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, so I think the way that we consume, we get smarter and smarter, and we become just like you, we saw through and ignored television ads. By the end, I think um, communications are going to be more intimate. So we're going to be in these communities online that might not have big audiences like they were before they might get smaller and smaller and communities will become um, more, more intimate, I think. And so the, the communities around your brand will might have a smaller audience, but I think they will be a more engaged audience and it's the authenticity of your brand. It will stand out and that will attract people to you. So my prediction is smaller, but more intense communities, less, less speaking to the masses, more, more intimate conversations. Cool. I like that, Amy, too. I just want to chip my bit in there. I think, you know, social media is obviously in a massive growth phase. Uh, the tool that's enabling a lot of that is the mobile phone, which is still in a growth phase as well. And, and mobile phones are in a growth phase in many, many countries. But we've already seen in some of the stats we've shown in this course here, it talks about messenger uh, applications rising quite dramatically. So I think that's probably one of the things which will change the way social media works. And I think to that end also the rise of stories across um, Instagram first, probably Facebook and um, Twitter, then that's also saying that social media is evolving and changing. That'd be my two bobs worth. Do you have anything, Beth, or would would you like to go to the next question? Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm with Amy, really, because I think the question came to, um, you know, what happens when ad blockers become, you know, so popular that we, or more increasingly use it, we're blocking out everything except for essential information. I think um, the essential information part is important there because if you asked everybody who was here um, in the class tonight what they viewed essential information, we'd, we'd get a really um, broad... Mm-hmm cross-section of comments about that. Personally, I I love ads in social media, so (laughs) I don't use an ad blocker. Um, And, you know, it's a a bit like um, I'm I'm actually not into trail bikes at all, but I am into a sport called, a horse sport called cutting, and it's not where you cut up horses. It's where you you, you ride a horse to um, separate cows from a herd. And, you know, I get disappointed with the cutting businesses and the cutting community. They don't advertise enough. Like I, I'm I'm looking for them all the time. I'm going on their website, I'm doing things, and they don't engage with me. And, um, you know, they could, they could do that through, at, you know, advertising very small spend on Facebook because I'm telling them that I'm interested. So I think it comes back to that thing and it, it links into what Amy says. It's to do with relevance and what we care about. And, you know, Andrew's community is trail bikes. I'm sure he loves getting trail bike ads just as much as mm. I like getting ads about saddles and <laughs> cutting events. <laughs> cool. Never heard of that one. Um, mm. I could have I could have given you that picture tonight, but I, yeah. I didn't. Mm. Oh, you've, you've just done wonders for the the cutting industry. Now um, we'll have 150 people going and checking it out after the webinar. Uh, Ruth has asked like a really sensible question, given you know, like we're talking about 
you know, perhaps we're going to have social media for some time. How, how do you stay on top of the, the changes to social platforms? She says, every time I get my head around functionality, they, they change it and they update it. Um, is there any like really like solid advice as to how to keep on top of it? Um, and, and how important is it to be an early adopter of new functions and features? Um, I, well, I could start off there if you like with, uh, with Facebook. Okay. And it changes every day that, you know, I, I log in there to do some work in it and it's business manager change, ad manager is different. There's some new feature today. And uh, the, the number one message from me is don't panic because fundamentally what you're doing there is is going to be the same. Like they're, they're, um, they're little tweaks and, sure, if you're at, at such a level that you want to understand all those little tweaks and sometimes they have benefits, sometimes they're, you know, a shiny bird that's, that will just distract you, just keep keep on course with what you're doing and, and don't worry about it too much. Um, if you've got a particular channel that you are, you know, that you prefer or that you're focused on, then it is worthwhile to follow the experts in there because they will be, um, you know, the, the Facebook blog, for example, I have to read that to keep up with this little tiny tweak and this little other twi- tiny tweak, but it's it doesn't really fundamentally change what I do day to day. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks, Beth. That's really, they're really good points. I think the it is really hard to stay on top of what's going on, but there's a lot of specialist providers that can help you in that deep dive into particular areas. There's so much that you can kind of glean yourself. I suppose the short courses are one way of doing that. From a strategic point of view, I would say once you've got a strategy, it's going to help you understand what kind of things you should be doing within a social media channel. And that's also going to help you decide which part of that channel or tools that you use in that channel that you adopt and how fast you adopt them. I'd be, be worried about getting caught into a trap where your competitors are doing something, but you don't really understand the full implications of it and how your target market will react to, to different things. So yeah, t- take a kind of balanced approach would be my, my recommendation on that one. Okay. Uh, anyone want to add anything else before we move on to the next question? Silence means no. Uh, and a question from Michaela. Um, do you think organic reach is more valuable than paid reach? Uh, and if you are having getting trouble, if you're having trouble getting organic likes, is this just the way social media is nowadays? Um, I vaguely remember that being the case that, that organic is, is generally preferred, but um, I guess if that's the case first, actually we'll just find out first <laughs> and then maybe I'll ask a question if that is the case. I can start off that one too. Organic's, massively more powerful like all advertising uh, consumers are very astute to what advertising is and they know that some company organization paid to be in that particular position and when they paid to be in that position then they want a particular result from that so likes website hits and a range of things so it loses credibility from that point of view the, the slight variation of that is like Beth said, when you're enrolled into say cutting or motorcycles or enduro or whatever it might be and you've opted into that kind of advertising, then you're probably interested to learn new things. And part of that is also that advertising is a really important way for us to find information. Admittedly, there's a lot of, and I suppose in its worst scenario, we call it spam when stuff is just being thrown out there or bombarded with, with different messages. But once you've, you've, targeted what you want and you're interested in those kind of things and it's really probably important and you actually look forward to getting that kind of advertising that said organic reach say in google google search is the most powerful place to be an example though from car sales from a number of years ago now though is that they do their best work when they organic search at number one they do better work when they organic search at number one and have an ad sitting straight over the top of that and their less, their less um, click-throughs and et cetera is when they only have a paid ad sitting at the top of a Google search page. So that's a good example. What else, what other guys, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, t- I totally agree um, on, on that, Andrew, about um, kind of authenticity and organic reach being, being just kind of more credible on social. I think the other thing is like on, on that point of like, is this just the new reality like do we just have to accept that organic reach is low especially on say facebook or instagram that 
it, it really comes down to your own performance. Like have a look at your own organic reach rate um, and make a call on what you need to do at that point. Because for some brands, even though like everyone talks about how organic reach is like so terrible and so dramatically low for some brands, it's actually quite high. So, um, you know, I, I think understanding that first and foremost and benchmarking what is happening over time to that, is it actually going up or down? If it's going up, that's incredible because you're bucking the trend. But if it's going down, then you you may reach a point where you, you have no other choice but to kind of like start investing in paid support to actually push a message out. Um, so I'd look at the kind of your your performance and how that's looked over time. And also not to forget that engagement helps in the Instagram and Facebook algorithms as well. So if people are commenting and asking questions or even having some banter with their friends, if you can chime in in a valuable way as a brand, that could also help your reach and ranking. Yeah, I think for me it, it kind of depends on uh, what kind of business you are. So, you know, there's enthusiast businesses and they will always have higher organic reach than um, non-enthusiast businesses. Um, so, you know, I'll give you some examples. Um, a business around sport trail bikes, given that we're talking about that, is going to have enthusiasts. Its organic reach is always going to be higher than, you know, a car dealership or um, a tech company. Um, so sometimes partnership strategies can really help with organic reach for those kind of businesses that have less enthusiasm around them. Um, so, you know, with charities or community organisations, so that the, the brand is actually partnering with a, um, an organisation in social that has an enthusiast community around it. So that's one way that you can address organic reach where, you know, it, it's going to be very hard for your business to reach that. And, and then you just, you know, you always, you just accept the fact that you are going to have to go for paid support for, um, you know, to, to really grow um, the reach or to, you know, to get your posts seen, get your ads seen. Alrighty, thank you. I think maybe that'll answer David's question as well, who's, who reckons he's selling an unexciting product, being a statistics package, hoping to make it exciting. I think... Um, perhaps between the the be authentic if you if you think it's an unexciting product well don't try and dress it up as something it isn't but also you know some people will be enthusiastic about it so um, I have to butt in on that one guy you yeah. know every everybody has an exciting product to somebody else and the statistic package is a great example there is a bunch of nerdy statisticians probably it's one of the most sought after job careers or sought after vacancy high vacancy rates people who are um, statisticians now so a range of people will be interested in let's say it's a software package that can help people do statistics or interpret or learn or do those things so there is an enthusiastic audience out there and the trick is is which social channel particularly in our course will reach that particular you know and i would call them a nerdy group of people but they want and they need help and support in statistics so they'd be excited to meet david yeah, it sounded pretty cool. I had a chat with David a couple of weeks ago on the phone. I, I like the sound of it. Uh, Ruth has asked um, an interesting question that I have little idea about. But uh, recently, there has been a, resurg a resurgence in long-form content with the advent of IGTV, Facebook Watch, Snap Originals, Snap Originals, and Twitter TV. Will most of these premium, in, uh, in quotation marks, uh, content channels be subscription-based models? And if not, how do you see this impacting on advertising strategies? And would anyone like to nominate to go first? I can, I can have a crack at that one again. Can you just read the first part of the question out again, Guy, for me? Sure. So recently there's been a, a resurgence in long form content with IGTV, Facebook Watch, Snap Originals and Twitter TV. Um, how do you see these? impacting on advertising strategies i think they they become some of the the new opportunities for people to pursue in terms of their their um uh opportunities to communicate and certainly there are some things that people will 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 sit and watch or consume content on um and uh, gosh i remember the coney 2012 
thing. If anybody else remembers that, that was a 30 minute piece of video that 100 million people watched within seven days. It was massive at the time. So there's a long form piece of content which people were absolutely fascinated by. Uh, things fell apart for the guy a little bit after that. So I think what they're feeding, so the Instagram TV, Twitter, et cetera, they're saying that if you've got a strong audience on the, either of those platforms, and you think that they will consume something more interesting then and it may be about the statistics package because they're particularly there though i'm thinking the place was not quite right for that one but if it's about uh, tourism queensland on instagram for example then oh my gosh chuck together 20 minutes of you know the top five tourism locations in um central queensland for a holiday for couples you know do something very purposeful for a target audience which you know exists in that that space that allows you to then build in, you know, the action calls for Queensland. They can go to the tourism website. They can reach out to a number of tourism providers probably to do that. Uh, they can do more Google searches, which they'd have link backs to the, the tourism sites and all that sort of stuff. So I think it could be quite powerful. Part of this whole, you know, longer form content in this, in the particular examples we just talked about then is about trying to catch up with YouTube. YouTube is the second most, um, uh, used platform in the world right after Google, I think. I think, oh no, so maybe it's Google, Facebook, and then YouTube. Uh, YouTube is certainly the second biggest search engine in the world. And they've had, you know, a huge amount of success with short form, long form video. Then they've allowed people to, to pay for, to put content in front of and behind and a whole range of things. So I think other platforms are playing a little bit of catch up with that. I think Instagram will do it really well because of the audience that uses Instagram and how they use it and the appreciation of, um, you know, fine video or photographic footage. Twitter, be interesting to see how it forms out in that place. Twitter people, you know, born on 140 characters to watch 10 minutes of video there would be a little unnerving possibly. So horses for courses. I think you need to investigate these things and, and see how they go. Does anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, I think there's... But Oh, sorry, Beth. No, go on, Amy. Yep, go um, for I was just going to say there's opportunities for, like, in three different areas as far as I can see. There's opportunities for partnerships. So you can partner with creatives. Imagine if you had a business that um, couldn't make something themselves, but you can support someone who can make something really great and be part of something that is a long form production. Um, that's, that's an amazing way to support your business's message. Um, you could also have the opportunity to create something yourself on those channels and also to advertise. As someone said earlier, um, things like Netflix, you can't just pop in that in front of, but on these social networks, it'll definitely be a thing. Yes, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Two things, partnership and also advertising. So you can already, Depending on the size of your brand on Facebook, you can already um, uh, advertise into Facebook Watch. Um, I'm not sure about uh, Instagram um, TV, but I'm pretty sure you can do it there already now. So it, it, it kind of, it's, it's not open to everybody and I think that that's not a bad thing either. Um, but, you know, I agree with Amy that... Everyone's got a story to tell. It's just the way that you, a long form story to tell. It's just about how you tell that story. Absolutely. Beauty. All right. Well, we've got a, a question from Lewis. Um, might be a good one to start with. Amy, is there an easy way to repurpose content captured in portrait format for Instagram stories to landscape format, which works best on other channels such as Facebook posts? And maybe Tim as well, you were talking about. Um, well, changes to Facebook. <laughs> I'd say this this is good to speak to my business. Um, when I create on site, um, like my business social fields, when I go out and create for a brand, I know from my perspective to shoot in portrait for stories, landscape if they want website banners and keep an eye on where the rule of thirds are if I want a square version as well. So you can create that shot um, from the very beginning and have it ready to go in all those different formats. But it also speaks to if you want, um, if you are shooting in high quality images that are billboard size, you can, you can change them however you like and you might be able to um, make, them, make them work in different settings. But I, I wouldn't force things. I'd shoot from the beginning if you can. Anything to add, Tim? 
Um, no, not really. But definitely agree that um, yeah, if you if you can control that at the start, um, shoot them both. Like if it means two smartphones or an SLR that's doing landscape and a smartphone doing portrait, like just give yourself options. Um, but yeah, if you if you can also shoot in high high quality, as Amy's saying, like fantastic, then you then you can kind of utilize the high quality image and, and make that work in in multiple formats too. Alrighty, thanks. A uh, question from Sayaka, and maybe just have a, a few more questions. We'll probably go for another five minutes or so. Hope everyone's enjoyed the the, the panel for uh, format. Uh, Sayaka has asked if you manage a large brand locally and your international distributors create their own social media platform to promote it um, maybe in competition or, or like locally to you as well um, and they're possibly doing it poorly what's your advice for this do you, do you shut yours down uh, or do you, or do you sort of um, embrace it and sort of go for the competition I can start on this one if you like uh, sure. I think that was a question that was in the, the Q&A box here as well uh, I think, you know, social media is not going to go away and individual distributors, et cetera, are not going to not do social media in either a good or a poor way. So I think what you can do as a kind of national distrib a national supplier or global supplier of a product or service is um, give each of your distributors a guide on how to, how to do awesome social media in their target market, utilize their knowledge of the local market, the local social media platforms, which there's a lot of variety in different areas of the world. But, give them awesome content, give it to them in a number of languages, give them, uh, you know, carousels, give them video, give them, uh, you know, short form video as it might be or long form video as you might want to do it and kind of work with them, train them up, drop them into courses like this possibly, do a range of things to improve everybody's um, smartness in terms of using social media for your brand. I think too, to add something to that, if, if you've got um, like global company controlling the social media, um, you know, and they're based um, internationally somewhere, uh, there's often quite strict rules to what um, the local brand can do in social. Certainly, um, this is my experience of it. Um, so a couple of, couple of ways to go around that is Facebook does have a... Um, a product where it's called it's called local local business and so you have this mothership if you like which can be the global brand and then attached to that you have um, local pages so you can then post directly to the local pages but you can also distribute content from the mothership if you like to all of the other pages so it was it was kind of set up to deal with this one of the difficult things about that is that every page has to have the same name so if you've got variations in the name, then that's not going to work so well. The, the second thing is in LinkedIn, you'll often see that you'll have um, a company page that has the global brand. And then in LinkedIn, there is a thing called showcase pages. And what showcase pages does is um, kind of break the business down either by division. So let's say you're a huge um, engineering and mining business and you might have you know, various parts of your business that are relevant to others. So you might have, you know, engineering, you might have mining um, resources or something like that. So showcase pages can divide it by content or also divide your, um, your business up by location. So, you know, you could have your global brand and then you could have your local brand as a showcase page in LinkedIn. And that can really work as a way to, um, kind of match you with the with the power of the global brand, which you definitely want, um, but at the same time get that local content happening, which people kind of care about and are more engaged with in many ways. That's probably what I've got to say about that. Beauty, thank you. Uh, really interesting chat topic. Um, Philip's talking about AI. Um, how will AI affect what happens in social? <laughs> already is <laughs> yeah. uh, well from my point of view you've got um, you know the machine learning is we're already seeing that uh, I guess that's why I said you know you you tag up your um, your pages with pixel code and then you let the master platform that has been learning about your audience and about what your business is about um, that is, you know, the Facebook platform for Instagram and Facebook and 
um, and let it do its thing. In many ways, it's been doing that. It's just been the whole AI process has been, um, uh, you know, at play there. And that's the evolution that we've seen in the Facebook advertising platform. I think we should also be careful about what that can be created with the intelligence that's coming. Um, I've heard um, stories of things like, imagine being able to recreate somebody's voice and put it on someone else's lips and making them move. I think we need to be smart about what we see, what we view, and not take everything at, um, at gospel. Um, just be, be smarter about how we consume and what we consume and what we believe at first glance as well. Yeah, sort of following on from that, Philip, sort of talking about, you know, uh, Internet of Thing integrating with store cameras, getting facial recognition involved and, and targeting people individually within stores and without. So um, ethical issues to consider, which is something you can do in the, in the paid courses, was just talking with the lecturer in that last night. Okay, I'll have a quick look. Is there any, any other questions you want to tackle, Andrew, from the, from the panel, uh, for, for the panel? Uh, no, I've uh, just been reading through some of the open Q&A questions there and answering a few of those directly and uh, just checking the chat to see what's going on there as well. But I think, um, no, I, I'm good. Other people got some more questions they would like to fire at us or would you like to wrap it up? Uh, maybe we wrap it up. Just maybe any uh, final comments on, on anything from everyone tonight? We'll maybe start with Beth. Oh, it's just been a pleasure to be involved and I and I did see a bit of chat there about the pixel and oh, we tried to get our pixel on, we tried to get our pixel on. Uh, I'll just give you a little tip. If you use a WordPress site, then there is um, a WordPress plugin called Pixel Caffeine or Pixel Your Site, Pixel My Site, one of the, either one of those two and um, they're very simple to use. So if you if you WordPress, just just go to um, the WordPress plugin store and grab yourself those. I think Pixel Caffeine is free. Um, if it's uh, if you're not, if you're a custom site or something else, then, you know, grab the code and um, that's a relatively simple thing to do and send it off to your developer and it is worth, um, it's worth just going through that little struggle if it is going to be a struggle to get the benefit down the track. Thank you. Uh, Tim? Yeah, look, um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And it's, it's great to have joined the other panelists tonight and actually all come together and, and answer questions live. So, um, yeah, always um, keep testing, keep, keep trying um, different content, different targeting, um, different days, different times, different frequencies, um, and good luck. I mean, I think, yeah, try and stay stay up to date as much as you can. And one site um, I might suggest is socialmediatoday.com. Um, that's another good blog for, for keeping on track uh, of all of these changes as they come out. Thank you. Amy? And just a big uh, thanks from me. And I also like to say, don't be scared of analyzing your own behavior when it comes to consuming on social media. You are part of a demographic and profile yourself and go talk to people um, that you know, like I talk to my little cousins about Snapchat and the things they're using all the time just to, just to know how it evolves and how it's being consumed by different demographics. So that's something that's constantly moving. But, yeah, just, just good luck, everyone, and there's experts everywhere if you need them. <laughs> thank you. And I might jump in now and say thank you, everyone, tonight, uh, Beth, Tim, uh, Amy, Alicia as well for, if you're listening to the recording, thanks for sending that video in. Um, yeah, thanks for the discussion and your generosity with your time here over the whole course. Um, uh, particularly, Andrew, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. That's been a, a real pleasure. Um, you know, never had a, a short course with so many guest speakers that I've been involved with, so thank you very much. Thank you to those listening live or later on in the recordings and, and all of the involvement in the forums um, and the chat. Your, your participation really does help ensure that future short courses are developed um, and have, I think, made this course far richer. Uh, again, all short course exam information is on the course page, so have a look at that before sitting it, and good luck with that. I hope you've enjoyed the course, got something out of it, um, no matter what your goals are. We're going, we're going into it. Um, 
yeah, just thank you all so much. And, and I'll hand over to Andrew for the last time to bring us to a close. There you go. Thanks very much, Guy. It's certainly been a pleasure to do it. It has been great fun and um, a few funny f moments to reflect on. We had last week, we had the, the hashtag lonely, I think, trending. And I just wanted to tell everybody who's listening to the course that when you're doing these mooky kind of things you sit in a room usually by yourself with a set of headphones on and because everybody gets muted it's totally silent and you sit there talking to your computer screen and you go oh wow is there someone out there is there anyone out there uh so it's a very strange thing that uh leech has got the other week and um a few people picked up on that with the hashtag lonely so lots of cool things about this uh leisha's just on twitter at the moment too she says thanks from alicia and be original be innovative and be authentic so that's her final parting message as well uh it's been a pleasure to work with all of these guys and i just love watching you guys help each other out on the chat i've seen it being stuff being shared on uh, social media as well through each of the people in the group so there's just a massive amount of combined learning there i've learned stuff hopefully everybody else has learned stuff and uh we get to get to make the world a better place by um just purely through our use of social media maybe as simple as that but lots of other good things so appreciate everyone's uh input involvement and i uh, look forward to catching you online again for another course at some point in the, in the future so thanks very much guy and it masters <laughs>